Well, hello everyone and welcome back to Science in the Age of COVID-19. Uh, we hope that everyone is being careful out there and um, hopefully that you've upgraded your mask maybe to um, N95 or doubling up. Stay safe. Uh, today we are super happy to welcome Aaron Ring, a professor of immunobiology at Yale. Uh, a theme that um, you no doubt have uh, picked up on is that, of course, many of our speakers were not previously experts in coronaviruses, uh, certainly not in SARS-CoV-2. Uh, today's speaker, um, and, and then, you know, they changed as the pandemic exploded, shifted their research program. Uh, today's speaker did even more than that and was not necessarily working on viruses much at all before this. Uh, his background is more in uh, structural biology, um, mechanisms of G protein couple receptors, kinases, uh, evolution and uh, use of nanobodies as reagents to study all these things. And we are very glad that he decided to uh, shift his program to work on COVID and the role of autoantibodies. So Aaron, take it away. Yeah, thank, thanks so much for, for inviting me to present our work. And, and for those who haven't met me before, uh, as Lauren was saying, I would describe our, our research interests in that in my lab, we're, we're immune receptorologists. We're fascinated by the, the communication circuitry of the immune system and, and using structure-based protein engineering to make pharmacologic tools that we could use to interrogate these complicated immunoregulatory pathways. Uh, but over the last few years, we've also initiated a, a, a new parallel track in my lab, which is to study the natural pharmacology of the immune system, namely autoantibodies, uh, and developing tools that we can use to, to profile previously unknown responses and to gain insight into diseases. Um, and it just so happened that, that the pandemic um, hit just as this technology uh, was maturing. So I'm delighted to tell you about this, this new direction in our lab and what we found related to COVID. Uh, before I do, though, I, I just want to uh, acknowledge my, my competing financial interests. So in my lab, we engineer proteins. Some of those um, are now being advanced as therapeutics and have been involved in the commercial efforts to bring them into the clinic. And then related to this talk, I also, that the technology, the REAP technology I'll discuss, um, I'm looking to commercialize in this company called Seranova Bio. So as I was saying, we've gotten extremely interested in, in the natural pharmacology of the immune system. And the immune system is an incredible source of natural biologic products, autoantibodies, antibodies that are recognizing our own antigens. And typically when we think about autoantibodies, we think about those that are harmful, that are driving autoimmune, autoinflammatory disease, and as I'll show you later, that contribute to, to severe COVID and different manis, manifestations of the disease. Um, but there's also a growing appreciation that some autoantibodies are actually protective and that they can ameliorate or, or prevent disease in patients. And this has been seen in a whole variety of, of conditions from autoimmune disease where patients that make antibodies that neutralize cytokines, inflammatory cytokines have less severe disease like IL-1 and, and RA and interferon and lupus. Um, in cancer, we've known for decades that patients that make autoantibodies against their tumors live longer than those that don't with a, a you know, a, a classic example of patients uh, with breast cancer that make HER2 antibodies. They're literally making their own trastuzumab. Uh, they, they have better survival. And even the diseases that aren't typically thought to be related to the immune system at all, like neurodegeneration, um, there are numerous examples of protective autoantibodies. For example, uh, patients with eight Alzheimer's disease who have anti-amyloid antibodies tend to have more slowly progressing disease. And in some patients who are very elderly and entirely cognitively intact have these antibodies, including against synuclein, against tau, et cetera. And in fact, there's even um, a drug, aducanumab, uh, that is currently being evaluated uh, for FDA approval for the treatment of, of Alzheimer's disease. And this, this anti-amyloid antibody was actually cloned out of a patient. So our, our conviction here is that by studying autoantibody responses, and correlating them to disease outcomes that we can learn a lot about the etiology of diverse diseases, much in the same way that, that rare genetics can teach us about important pathways. These rare autoantibody responses can have a big impact. And so the question is, how do you find them? Certainly all of these examples were like looking under the lamppost. Why did we look at cytokines and autoimmune disease? It's pretty straightforward. They were known contributors. 
HER2 in breast cancer, again, it was one of the, you know, it's one of the most uh, important oncogenes in that particular disease. Um, you know, amyloid and Alzheimer's. Again, you know, it, it's a pretty straightforward hypothesis. What we really need to do is to have an unbiased, non-candidate antigen-based approach so, so, so we can have, you know, proteome genome scale resolution. So in thinking about autoantibodies as, as potential targets and as mediators of, of differential um, disease outcomes, it, you know, if you think about what antigens are most interesting, really these are extracellular antigens. Antibodies are large, 150 kilodalton proteins. Uh, they're secreted into the extracellular space. And by and large, the other proteins they'll come into contact with or antigens they'll come into contact with are those that are in the same topological compartment, the extracellular space. Um, and, and indeed, if you think about how antibodies can exert a function, it can be related to blocking a receptor ligand interaction, stabilizing a ligand, directly activating receptors, or targeting cells for destruction by antibody effector functions through complement mediated killing, through antibody directed cell mediated cytotoxicity, ADCC, or phagocytosis. So it's, it's the exoproteome, the extracellular proteome, that is, I, I, would, I would contend, we would contend in my lab is the most important target of functional autoantibodies. That's not to say that, that antibodies that recognize intracellular and nuclear targets aren't important. They can be very important diagnostically. They can form immune complexes that contribute to disease, but they're less likely to be functional in the sense that they're teaching us about you know, new pathways that, that could be targeted for disease. Uh, and, and making matters worse is, is not only, you know, is this, is this, are these types of proteins particularly important, they're among the hardest to sample. Uh, and, and that is because uh, autoantibodies by and large recognize proteins in their conformational three-dimensionally folded state. Um, over, you know, it's been estimated as many as 90% of all autoantibodies recognize conformational epitopes in, as opposed to linear um, epitopes that, that are not conformation dependent. But these extracellular proteins are among the hardest to produce. They have unique folding requirements involving signal peptide removal, disulfide bond formation, post-translational modification with glycosylation, et cetera. Um, and, and they're fragile. They, they're, they're prone to denaturation pretty easily. And so, um, so you know, most existing technologies that are used to discover uh, autoantibodies, novel targets of autoantibodies, rather autoantigens, um, are not well suited for this type of important protein. So, so the gold standard to, to discover functional antibody responses is, is to do direct screening. You have a hypothesis about an antigen, you, you screen a lot of patients by ELISA or similar technique, uh, or you, you find an antibody that you think has um, a role, you've, you've cloned it out for instance, then you try to find what it binds say with you know, IP mass spec. But again, this requires a hypothesis, some prior knowledge of the antigen or the antibody. So there are you know, really powerful technologies for unbiased profiling in, in autoantigen discovery. For instance, you know, arrays of, of thousands or tens of thousands of proteins on a chip um, or, or really innovative combinatorial approaches like the phage immunoprecipitation seek. This is a, a genius approach developed um, you know, by, by Ben Larman uh, back when he was in Steve Elledge's lab. Uh, it, it's called FIPSeq and they have a, a whole library where they scan the entire proteome in you know, 50 to 70 amino acid stretches. Works phenomenally well. They've found a lot of autoantigens. The problem is that, you know, unfortunately, this approach and other similar approaches like bacterial display of peptides, they, they don't capture proteins in their, in their conformational state because they're just, you know, showing a portion of it. Uh, and so, you know, we were wondering if, if we could address this problem with some of the technologies that we've been using in my lab for, for protein engineering. And in particular, in my lab, we, we've, you know, for, for quite some time, even before I started my own lab, I, I was using this technology for protein engineering. We've been drawn to the, the yeast system, the yeast surface display. Yeast are eukaryotic cells. They have an endoplasmic reticulum. They secrete proteins. They form disulfides. They do perform glycosylation. It's a different glycosylation than, than what we put on our proteins. But nevertheless, as eukaryotic cells, they can capture a lot of the, of the complexity um, that our own cells do. And it turns out that that you know yeast surface display technology, where you you tether a protein to the cell wall of yeast, and link that phenotype to a gen, to a genotype, you know, to a plasmid that encodes the protein, has been used extensively to engineer proteins, all manner. You know, and we've worked on cytokines, cytokine receptors, immunoreceptors, 
you know, all sorts of different protein folds that I've shown here and others, uh, even complex assemblies like peptide MHC complexes, full intact antibodies, um, you know, have been used in yeast display. Uh, in, in the era of COVID, um, you know, Jesse Bloom's lab has used yeast display to scan um, you know, every possible mutation in the uh, spike receptor binding domain to see, you know, which residues are most important for binding the, the ACE receptor and then ACE2 receptor and then predicting potential mutations. Um, so, uh, you know, clearly um, yeast display is a pretty robust technology to, to capture extracellular secreted proteins. And so we made a big bet a few years ago that not only were yeast good at this, they would be able to, to capture most of the exoproteome. And so we, over the last few years, have curated a, a huge library of thousands of human proteins, displayed them on the surface of yeast, uh, and then, you know, so that each yeast cell in the library has its own protein on its surface, and that's linked to a unique genetic barcode that we can use to track it. Uh, and we've displayed all sorts of different proteins in this library. And with this library, we've been able to do a lot of things and, and related to, to you know, my presentation today, we've used it to discover um, autoantibodies through this, this platform that we call REAP, Rapid Exoproteome Antigen Profiling. And the way REAP works is we take the yeast library, we mix it together with a patient sample um, in, a, in a microtiter plate, and then we can rapidly identify which yeast are displaying an autoantigen by magnetically isolating those IG, patient IgG coded yeast and then sequencing their barcodes. And so we turn an antibody antigen binding event into a digital sequencing exercise. And we basically are looking for enrichment pre versus post. Uh, and what this allows us to do is, is to monitor autoantibody responses to about 3000 human extracellular antigens, which is the tiny amount of patient sample, you know, the equivalent of 50 microliters or less of, of serum or plasma. And you know, with exquisitely high throughput, you know, our throughput, you know, one graduate student in my lab can run uh, 800 samples in a day. So we're really limited by, by samples and annotation more so than, um, than this process. So um, I just wanna show you a little bit about the, the background and our characterization of, of the system and, and how it works. So we, we first started off saying, all right, can we at least get this to work for monoclonal antibodies? Can we take an antibody with a known specificity against one of the members of this library and then you perform REAP and see if we fish out the, the proper antigen target. And so we, we got a collection of nine different antibodies that recognize different members of the library, performed REAP, and gratifyingly we saw that you know, we could isolate and we could detect the, the binding, the enrichment of yeast that have that express these particular antigens. So just to give you an idea what the data looks like, you know, here is um, you know, for CD25, also called IL2 or alpha, um, you can see that we uniquely enriched um, CD25 displaying yeast as opposed to all the other members of the library. Um, so, you know, we also wanted to know, okay, antibodies are good, but are these proteins really active? Now, clearly we can't test all 3000 members of the library one by one. That would be an incredibly uh, challenging task. But what we did do is we, we sampled a few dozen of these proteins and tested their activity on the basis of, of binding to their known binding partner. So we, we, we expressed their binding partners as FC fusions recombinantly, panned them by REAP, and then looked to see if we got enrichment of, of their res respective target antigen. And, and, and the answer is, yeah, this, this worked pretty well. You can see that, that we were able to successfully and specifically enrich for, for binding partners across a huge range of proteins for their respective ligands, even with the big range of affinities. So for instance, you can see, you know, PD-1, um, and, you know, bound PDL1 right here, and then CD80, which binds PDL1 even weaker, also specifically enriched. So that was good to see. Um, all, all manner of proteins, cytokines for cytokine receptors, those are high affinity, efferents for efferent receptors, um, you know, growth factors for the receptors, um, you know, some receptors that bound a bunch of different ligands, like the NKG2D receptor right here, binding its many, um, you know, NKG2D ligands. So this gave us a lot of, a lot of confidence that, 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 that uh, number one, that our method was working, and number two, that the library um, had you know, fairly high quality and that it was um, displaying proteins by and large in a confirmationally active state. So the question is, could, could we use this REAP system to detect autoantibodies? And again, we wanted to start off you know, with, with sort of a, a controlled situation. And we wondered, could we, could we take a, a, a disease where there were known extracellular autoantibodies and then accurately and faithfully detect 
the um, use route to detect those antibodies. Since we started with this rare monogenetic disease called Apicid, uh, this is a, a disease caused by loss of the air gene. So these patients lack central tolerance. They get just devastating polyendocrinopathies and other non-endocrine immune um, you know, uh, sequelae. Uh, and, and they also paradoxically get immunosuppression due to extraordinarily high titer antibodies against cytokines that neutralize their function, like type 1 interferons, IL-22, IL-17, um, well described in this condition. Uh, and so we obtained uh, 77 samples of patients with Apicid. We profiled them with REAP compared to um, healthy control. And what you're looking at in this heat map here, uh, every, every patient is a column, every antigen is a row. What immediately pops out, you can see that, yeah, we, we universally detected um, you know, the extremely high prevalence of antibodies against many different type 1 interferons, against interleukin-22, variably against IL-17, IL-5, type 3 interferons. We also found a bunch of known knowns, if you will, known autoantigens in this disease, like patients who had antibodies against gastric intrinsic factor here at the bottom. This causes vitamin B12 deficiency, pernicious anemia in these patients. And then we found a smattering of, of unique, previously undescribed private reactivities. You can see this little constellation of, you know, sort of, you know, one or two patients having a particular response. And then we even found some, some public autoantigens, like a smattering of patients who had antibodies against this glycoprotein hormone, GPHB5. And we went on to then validate that these, these, these hits that we predicted with, with REAP, um, you know, we confirmed them with an orthogonal assay like ELISA and found that, yeah, REAP was pretty good at making these predictions with a, with a receiver operating characteristic curve of about 0.89. Um, which, which is a good test. So it's not perfect, but, but certainly the predictions that it makes um, hold up well. But another thing we learned from this experiment was it's not only REAP a, a yes, no answer. Do you have an, an autoantibody or not? It's actually quantitative. And as you titrate the amount of patient sample to the library, you get a sigmoidal dose response and you can essentially calculate virtual titers um, for the levels of autoantibodies in these patients. And those virtual titers match up nicely with the titers measured through an orthogonal technique like ELISA. Um, but one interesting thing is that REAP is in, in many cases more sensitive than ELISA. It depends on the antigen. For some antigens, it's worse, but for many, it, it's significantly better. Uh, and just to show you how REAP stacks up head to head to other technologies, it turns out that you know, protein arrays and, and FIPSEC have been used in the same patient populations, and in some cases with the exact, with the exact same samples that we probe. And what we found is if you look at these, these well-characterized you know, um, gold standard autoantibodies, if you compare to the to, to a gold standard measurement like luciferase immunoprecipitation, REAP matches the known prevalence in this population on the nose. Um, whereas these other approaches had variable ability um, to sensitively detect uh, the presence of autoantibodies, in some cases missing them altogether. And of course, this is to say nothing about the, the novel autoantigens that we detected with REAP that were not found with these other technologies. I, I wanna make something clear. By no means are we um, are we saying that these other approaches are not extremely important. They're, they actually are, are viewing a, a much different segment of the proteome than what we see with REAP. They get cytoplasmic antigens, nucleoantigens that are not present in our library uh, and would not be displayable in our library. Um, but um, certainly it, it appears that REAP is better tailored for finding extracellular autoantibodies. So then we wondered if we could apply this to, um, you know, a, a more real world situation. And this is a, a program we started just a couple months before the pandemic hit. And when we started, we decided to look in, into lupus. So, so lupus is a fairly common autoimmune disease uh, caused by loss of tolerance to nucleic acids, but extremely heterogeneous in its presentation, um, definitely polygenic. And, and the role of, of functional autoantibodies um, in this disease uh, that bind extracellular antigens has not been nearly as extensively characterized as an apicid. There, there have been some reports of anti-interferon antibodies, but, but again, you know, no real, um, I shouldn't say real, no extensive characterization, um, you know, as has been done uh, in other indications. So we, we obtained 100, over 100 samples of patients with, with lupus, profiled again with REAP. And what you can see in this heat map is it's night and day difference with apicid. Uh, there are basically no public autoantibody responses. The most public would be, you know, a smattering of patients that have anti-interferon autoantibodies, 
But unlike Apis said, you know, each patient appears to be like a snowflake, having their own unique constellation of auto reactivities. Um, and on one hand, you know, initially you could be a little disappointed to say, well, you know, what is this really telling us if these if these responses are are sort of idiosyncratic and rare? On the other hand, I actually found this compelling. I said, well, you know, this is this is what you might expect if you did uh, if you did exome sequencing. You know, you, you wouldn't expect to see, um, you know. You, Rare, um, rare mutations can have a have a big functional impact, and so we dived in. And what we found is, even though individual responses were not particularly common, um, there were responses that that appeared to have a huge biological impact. So I'll give you a few vignettes. So here we actually ordered the patients on the x-axis here by their disease severity, and we found that you know an example of a patient who had incredibly mild disease, her, her sleet eye score, her, her disease score was one because she had an anti-DNA autoantibody, but beyond that, you know, didn't have, you know, particular cl clinical sequelae. Um, and, and she uniquely had extremely high titer antibodies against the cytokine interleukin-33. Um, they were present at greater than one to 10,000 fold um, titers. And not only were they, they, they very high titer, they also were functional. They potently neutralized the signaling of IL-33 ex vivo uh, with neutralization at titers of around one to 10,000. So this patient was essentially walking around with levels of, of IL-33 autoantibodies that you would expect after an IV infusion of an experimental drug. Uh, and so, you know, it stands to reason that, that perhaps those antibodies were protecting her. And, and sure enough, if you dive into the literature, you see IL-33 has been implicated in, in lupus. The levels are higher in lupus. It's involved in autoantibody production. There's even a report of a preclinical study where IL-33 blocking antibodies were, were used in, in a lupus prone mouse model, and they, per, they per, prevented uh, the development of the disease. So, you know, examples like this can really teach us about potential players in, in new diseases, but also suggest therapeutic strategies that we could use in the disease. Um, we also found other really interesting and, and sort of not really super well explainable autoantibody responses. Like we found, you know, this cluster of patients that had antibodies against the, the checkpoint protein PDL2, and, and they were present at decent titers, and they actually blocked the interaction of these pro, of the protein with its receptor PD1. What that means, unclear. But again, it was interesting to see that we could detect these sorts of functional antibodies. And with a larger cohort, we might be able to tease out um, some of the, the, the possible consequences of those antibodies. The other thing I want to point out is even though individual autoantigens might be rare, there definitely were some patterns of autoantibody reactivities that did seem to correlate with, with clinical severity. So what we found is that, that patients that made antibodies against any immunoreceptor that we detected in, um, in the REAP assay uh, for this, this cohort, they had much lower disease severity scores than patients who didn't have these antibodies. And so that, that suggests that antibodies against these targets may be immunomodulatory and might be protecting um, those patients similar to the IL-33 autoantibodies, although the function here is a little harder to establish. And then we did find some, some correlates of more severe disease. So for example, patients who had antibodies against this chemokine, CCL8, it's actually a Treg chemokine, um, they, they had more severe uh, disease scores and they had specific features of lupus like uh, lupus nephritis um, was enriched in, in these patients who had these autoantibodies. So um, you know, even though the study was, was relatively small, uh, it really drove home a point to us that yeah we could we could discover all sorts of of super interesting functional autoantibodies that that did seem to partition patients according to severity and could suggest novel areas um, of, of study and even a disease like lupus um, you know that that is extremely multifactorial. Um, but as I was mentioning, you know this we've been developing this technology for a few years and only recently has it become mature. And um, you know once the pandemic hit, it uh, in was really. Um, you know, bubbling up in the U.S. in March, um, we immediately wondered if, if autoantibodies could be involved and, and if we could use the REAP technology to profile it. Um, and certainly the role of the innate immune system in COVID is undisputed. The role of the adaptive immune system, particularly humoral immunity, is now coming into focus. So, you know, previous, in, in the first SARS pandemic, SARS-1, there were some reports that, that autoantibodies against the lung parenchyma were present in patients with severe COVID. So, you know, even before we had any data about COVID, we were reading those papers and thought, yeah, well, if it happened in the first, you know, SARS, um, you know, pandemic, perhaps this was happening in, in SARS-CoV-2 as well. Uh, and as we got more more data, you know, really the evidence converged that, that that humoral autoimmunity could be a significant player. 
So for example, you know, recently Ignacio Sanz's group showed that, that patients with COVID-19 had this really unique population, really interesting population of extra follicular double negative B cells that are typically found in lupus. What they found is these, these, these B cells that are typically associated with autoreactive antibodies um, appear to predict COVID-19 severity. Uh, coupled with that info, we've also seen reports that, that COVID patients have elevated classical rheumato rheumatological markers like ANA, anti-nuclear antibody, anti-phospholipid antibodies, antibodies um, you know, against rheumatoid factor, et cetera. Um, so you know, again, you know, the, the lines of evidence converging. And then this really seminal paper came out from, from Jean Laurent's Casanova's group, not implicating COVID as a trigger for autoimmunity, but implicating autoimmunity as a potential um, factor that was contributing to COVID severity. And they found that patients with severe COVID had much higher levels of antibodies against type 1 interferon which had been associated with many, many, many other chronic illnesses before, not just autoimmune disease, but, but cancer. But the idea here was that these patients' um, antibodies were, were interfering with this key antiviral cytokine. And essentially it was acting like you know, an innate um, inborn air of, of immunity, like they saw with genetics, and that those patients, their, their hypothesis is that they would have impaired responses to the virus. Uh, and then very recently, uh, Max Crummel's group found that that it wasn't just antibodies against type 1 interferon directly, but that but the COVID patients by and large had antibodies that seemed to inhibit in, you know, type 1 interferon receptor signaling through a mechanism that's not entirely clear, um, but involves inhibitory FC receptor um, activity. So, so check out that, that paper that just came out um, within the last week or two. Um, so we, we you know, at Yale, we uh, together working very, very closely with, with my colleague Akiko Osaki in her lab and you know, Akiko has been spearheading our, our translational efforts uh, in, in COVID. She's put together together with other colleagues like Albert Ko, um, an, an incredible repository of hundreds of, of COVID patient samples with, with extremely high levels of clinical annotation, associated aminophenotyping and immune profiling. Um, and, you know, this impact cohort has been a, a, a tremendous resource uh, at Yale and, and at other institutions as well in, in understanding uh, COVID. And so in that cohort, we, we screened over 200 patients uh, with COVID across a range of severity. These were, these were patients collected while they were hospitalized in the first wave of the pandemic in March and April and, and May uh, at, at Yale New Haven Hospital. And we, we performed REAP and immediately what stood out to us is that there were really high levels of autoreactivity against the exoproteome uh, in COVID. In fact, it was higher than was seen in severe lupus. Um, and some patients with COVID had levels of autoantibodies that approached what we would see in Apicid. So that immediately, you know, jumped out as saying, yeah, this is, you know, we profiled many diseases with REAP now. COVID is right up there with the highest levels of autoreactivity. And the other thing that jumped out at us too is that, um, that the immune system was a big target of autoantibodies in, in COVID patients. So we confirmed what Casanova had reported about the, the presence of type one interferon autoantibodies in these patients, but we also found type three interferons, a bunch of other cytokines, cell surface proteins of many different types of cells, um, chemokines and other inflammatory mediators, as well as you know, platelets, coagulation factors, et cetera. So you know, the immune system inflammatory response, um, those, those proteins were a big target of, of COVID. And just, just to give more color to what we saw with the type 1 interference. So, you know, Casanova's group reported that, you know, that the that these antibodies were enriched in severe patients, the idea being that by neutralizing interferon that you you don't get a good antibody, you don't get a good innate response to the virus, it gains a toehold, and that's how you get severe COVID. So, so we confirmed that. We, we found that severe patients were enriched in having anti-type 1 interferon autoantibodies. We showed separately that they were neutralizing, like Casanova found, um, but we also had longitudinal na nasopharyngeal swabs on these patients monitoring their viral RNA levels. And what we found was that patients who had type 1 interferon autoantibodies, they were unable to, over the course of their time in the hospital, were unable to clear the virus. You can see that over time, they did not achieve log fold and um, decreases in their viral levels in, in, in their nasopharyngeal passages, unlike you know, patients who don't have those antibodies where you can see a steady decline in the viral levels. So this provides evidence that these antibodies are truly impacting um, the, the activity of interferon in vivo and in, in, in impairing the, the virological response. 
But as I said, it's, it, it was not just interferon at all, that there were over 30 cytokines and in, in two dozen chemokine pathway members that were detected in our REAP system. And not only were they present at, at decent titers, you can see titers you know, of one to a thousand or greater, um, they were functional, right? So we found, for instance, uh, antibodies against GMCSF that inhibited GMCSF signaling against chemokines that impaired the um, ability of these chemokines to activate their G-protein coupled receptor, in this case of CCR2. Then we tried to establish a real causal link between these antibodies and you know, viral, you know, immunological function. T -t Tough to really do in patients. This is one of the limits of, of human immunology. So what we tried to do is, is try to model the effects of these autoantibodies in a mouse. And so we obtained mouse surrogates of these autoantibodies and, um, and, and administered them to a, a model of, of, of COVID-2 infection. This is the K, um, this is the K18 ACE2 mouse model. Uh, and as you can see, you know, for some of these antibodies that we found, like those against the IL-18 receptor pathway, um, when we administered them to the mice, they greatly exacerbated uh, the disease. So we, we found this for IL-18, for interferon, for IL-1 beta, um, and a few others um, that are, and you can check out our preprint to see um, that particular data. And we've also done immunoprofiling to really understand how these autoantibodies were impacting, um, you know, the immune response to the virus. Another thing that we found that I thought was particularly interesting is a whole array of antibodies against immune surface proteins. And so we, we asked, are those antibodies affecting those immune populations, for instance, by depleting them via ADCC, complement directed killing? And so um, it turns out we, we had really great flow data on those exact samples um, from some of Akiko's lab's prior studies. And what we found is if patients had autoantibodies against a particular type of cell, that cell ended up being in very low prevalence, suggesting depletion. So for example, we found patients that had antibodies against B cells. Here's one example of a patient with extraordinarily high titers of an anti-CD38 antibody, uh, and they had really low levels of B cells. And, and along with that, when we looked at their humoral responses to the virus, for instance, IgM against the receptor binding domain, they had much, much lower levels of autoantibodies against the RBD. And so this suggests that perhaps these patients had more severe disease because they had these antibodies that were interfering um, with, with B cells in their response to the virus. We also saw this with antibodies that targeted monocytes, classical monocytes. If they had those antibodies, they had you know, greatly decreased numbers of monocytes in their blood. Um, and even a, a patient who made antibodies against a, a T cell protein, a CD3 epsilon, um, and that patient had specific depletion of, of T cell populations, um, including CD4, CD8, and NK T cells, but did not have an, an impact on their B and or B or NK cells. Um, so it did appear they had sort of a selective depletion of, of cells that expressed um, that particular protein. Um, but you know, beyond the immune system, we also noticed that COVID patients made an incredible array of diverse autoantibodies against different tissues. So you know, the central nervous system vascular tissue, connective tissue, uh, different organs like the heart and the, and the, um, and the liver. Um, and as you can see, you know, a whole range of, of parenchymal more antigens. And, and one thing that was really interesting is that there, there were basically no COVID specific autoantibodies. Maybe you could convince yourself that some of these were particularly common in COVID. Um, although I, I would contend they may just be antibodies coming up. You know, there's polyreactive antibodies that happen to be coming up non-specifically. Um, but, you know, essentially no public, very few to no public antigens. And, and, and so to my mind, that argues against molecular mimicry as a major mechanism for development of most of these responses. Maybe some of them would be, but, but not most of them. Because if it was molecular mimicry, you would expect to see a handful of antigens come up, not, you know, several dozen. Um, and, and, and so what we started to do is start to see, well, do these, do these autoantibody patterns correlate with specific disease features? of COVID. And I, I should say, you know, clinical data is, is notoriously noisy. Um, and the REAP data, it, it is robust, but it also has some degree of, of noise. So, you know, I think as we expand these cohorts, we'll get more confidence in these types of, of relationships. But one thing I will say is that we, we have already started to see some correlations with, with particular autoantibody responses and specific features of the disease. So here's an example of a patient of of a, a autoantibody response against the hypocretin-2 receptor. This is the orexin-2 receptor um, it's expressed in you know, different um, parts of the brain, like the hypothalamus. And uh, what we found is that patients that had high levels 
of these autoantibodies um, had the, the worst neurological status as measured by the Glasgow Coma status, uh, Coma scale. Admittedly, it, it's a relatively crude um, marker of neurological function, but you know, there was unambiguously um, you know, a, a correlation between having these autoantibodies and having worsened uh, neurological function. And so that's an area that we're following up on. Uh, as well as you know, another you know, key implication is that you know, these autoantibodies in theory could last well after the virus has been cleared from the body. And so, so one um, you know, attractive hypothesis that we can glean from our research here is that some of these autoantibodies could contribute to the many manifestations of post-COVID syndromes um, that, that we see um, in, in such a diverse array of particular findings and, and symptoms that are seen with these patients, and that could match with a really heterogeneous array of autoantibodies that we see here. We are now testing that. We are, we have, we are obtaining samples from patients from, from post-COVID clinics, um, from long-term follow-up, and, and looking to see, you know, what is the, the persistence of autoantibodies, you know, for instance, from this exact same cohort. But even within this acute data, we were able to look at temporal dynamics of some of these autoantibodies. For instance, when we had multiple measurements from the same patient, and we, we essentially grouped them into three different classes of responses. Um, some that were high from the very early, um, you know, observations in the patient, literally within a few days of the onset of symptoms uh, of COVID, they were high. Like, and this is what you observe for the for the type one interferons. We would posit, given the time course, that these are likely pre-existing autoantibodies. We can't prove that, but it, it stands to reason that. Um, that given how high they are so early on in the, in the disease course, they're, they're probably predated the infection. Um, and then we, we saw some cases where autoantibodies clearly came up after the patient had been admitted to the hospital. And, and you know, there are many reasons that these could come up, but these, these definitely appear to be temporally connected to infection. Uh, and then we saw you know, examples of some types of, of antibodies like this that waned, and they went from very high levels you know, to, to, to nothing, um, over the course of that patient's time in the hospital. And so I think, you know, thinking about um, post-COVID syndromes, you know, certainly not all, you know, autoantibodies that come up in these patients are going to last a long time. It would be really important to get the long-term follow-up in these patients and see which antibodies persistent, persisted, which ones didn't, and can that explain, um, you know, long-term sequelae of COVID infection? Are these antibodies, you know, an unfortunate legacy uh, of COVID? And so that's what, you know, be an important question to find out. Um, so, you know, I think this is a, um, you know, this is a new area for my lab, so we haven't generated a ton of data. Uh, and so, you know, this is, this is a relatively short seminar, but hopefully I've been able to show you that this REAP platform does seem to be robust to detect interesting extracellular functional autoantibodies um, that have performed well in diseases like Apicet and lupus, you know, autoimmune diseases. And that in, in COVID, we saw some really interesting responses that could explain, um, you know, why the immune system wasn't working properly in some of these patients, um, why they may have gotten severe disease, and some, some hints into um, how COVID can manifest in such a unique array of, of clinical phenotypes, and potentially um, a handle into to future research into long COVID, as well as other viral infections. Um, one, I just want to wrap up by saying you know, one really important thing, if I leave you with nothing else, um, we really have a strong conviction that, that using technologies like REAP to take an unbiased proteome scale um, profiling of, of autoantigen responses will teach us a lot about the etiology of diseases, could teach us about new therapeutic targets. And, and in fact, these patient autoantibodies themselves could even be new therapeutics in and of themselves. Um, and so this is now becoming a, a big franchise in, in my lab, and we're looking to apply it, and we have been applying it to diverse array of diseases, cancer, autoimmune disease, neurodegeneration. Um, you know, if, if you're interested in profiling your favorite disease, you know, please, please contact me because we're, we're interested too. Uh, so with that, I, I would like to wrap up by acknowledging um, the, the fantastic team of people who, who made this research possible. Uh, so the REAP technology was developed by a trio of graduate students in my lab um, and, and an undergraduate, Eric Wong, an undergraduate, um, soon to be MD, PhD student, Ela Dai and Connor Rosen, these are immuno, immunobiology graduate students. Um, and then they collaborated uh, with Akiko's lab, particularly you know, two just phenomenal students, Tian Yang Mao and John Klein, um, to, to run the, the COVID patient samples and to perform collaboratively these analyses. And it's been such an honor to work with them, a real um, you know, dynamic interaction. And, and of course, I want to acknowledge my stalwart collaborator, my mentor, uh, Akiko Iwasaki, who's just a fantastic um, you know, uh, colleague to have. And of course, I also want to thank the, the people at Yale who were leading the efforts to obtain these samples. 
and uh, the Yale Impact team um, who put the repository together in our funding. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Aaron. Fantastic talk. And I am really excited to start the Q&A session because I'm sure we all have a lot of questions, especially after a talk like this. Thank you. Audience, again, a reminder, please feel free to go ahead, type your questions, uh, raise your hand. Uh, you can come chat with Aaron, ask your own question, or we will be more than happy to read out your question. Um, so as we get on to the audience question, let me start with a question that I have. So first of all, REAP is such a neat way to go about autoantibody discovery. Um, and autoantibodies clearly play a role in several diseases. So my question to you is how amenable is REAP to high throughput screening through even uh, progressing into a diagnostic tool? For example, I can imagine a situation where maybe you could screen several, several patients and controls and start having an autoantibody profile, signature profile for different autoimmune disease and then start screening for patients with symptoms to see, A, do they exhibit any characteristic signature? If so, could we bin them into moderate lupus, severe lupus, or what have you? And even this could extend to COVID also, like you know, patients who are starting to show severe COVID, can you just go ahead and um, screen them for these autoantibodies so that it could give us an idea whether they would progress into a longer, long hauler scenario? Yeah, I love the question because it, it, you know, it, it's something that's near and dear to my heart, which is how do we move um, discoveries in the lab into the real world? And and I think, you know, for me, that's always the test of, you know, what is a successful research program? You know, did it result in? Um, and, and by the way, it's not the only way you can have success in science, but but it is gratifying to to see, um, uh, you know, something develop out of the lab, whether it's a new drug, a new diagnostic, um, a new technology that that's being adopted. Uh, that is our goal to do exactly what you're saying. And, and you know, th there's many different ways that, that we can advance the, the REAP program. One it is a really ambitious one, which is we want to develop like a serological atlas. Can we profile thousands, tens of thousands of patients across an extremely wide array of diseases, not just autoimmune diseases, not just COVID, but cancer, um, you know, fibrotic diseases, uh, you know, neurodegenerative diseases, psychiatric diseases. Right now, mm -hmm. um, I, I was just contacted by uh, a psychiatrist who said, you know, did you know that, that um, you know, it, the, the genetics of schizophrenia point to the, um, the you know, multihistic compatibility locus as the big driver of, of, uh, of schizophrenia? Super, super interesting. Um, and, and I think that's where we can have a big impact is, you know, seeing those unexpected high impact responses where you, where you can learn something fundamental about disease. And, and I think our experience in COVID really did point us in that direction. Um, you know, so current, for instance, could we develop tests uh, around certain antigens that are particular autoantigens that are particularly impactful, like anti-type 1 interferon? Should we be pre-screening patients or the population at large for, for those who have anti-type 1 interferon antibodies and say, look, you guys need to be extra careful. If you get infected, you know, your course is much more likely to be mm -hmm. severe. In fact, should we prioritize you for vaccination? Yeah. And, and I should actually say that that is um, what Dr. Casanova's group is doing for, for type 1 interferon. Maybe we could we could find additional targets like that that could be high impact. Um, so not necessarily using REAP as a diagnostic itself, but but using the, the insights from REAP to develop those types of tests. Um, now, could we use REAP as a diagnostic? Uh, maybe. Not my lab. I think, you know, if you want to go into the clinical diagnostic area, you know, you really need to develop these tests at a level, you know, like a, a CLIA standard, as it's called. Um, that, that's sort of beyond what an academic lab like mine would do. But it's certainly, you know, it, it could be um, that, that is in the realm of possibility and, and something maybe that we could accomplish with, with a commercial effort, right? Um, you know, I, I know that uh, the, the Hughes group is um, pretty progressive, but hopefully, um, you, you know, uh, we, we can all acknowledge that uh, sometimes we do need to bring in uh, commercial partners to really fully realize the promise of our technologies. Um, and then, you know, the, the final thing I'll say is you know, in terms of throughput, uh, REAP has really tremendous throughput. Like I said, one graduate student in my lab can run 800 samples in a day. So we're not really limited by samples and that, that can scale pretty nicely. Um, but it is a sequencing based technology. So it's not really a, a test you could use acutely. You would, you would, you know, you really, it, it seems right now to be more of a research or maybe, you know, um, a type of assay you may run with a longer turnaround time. Interesting, thanks. Uh, or you could even um, screen convalescent plasma for the other antibodies because I mean, I don't know uh, this big therapeutics, but even for research. Um, uh, absolutely, well, and not only that, but you know, um, 
<laughs> something like convalescent plasma, you, on one hand, it may have great antibodies against the virus, but what if you're also now infusing a patient with, yeah, with some auto antibodies, yeah. right? So um, that definitely has crossed our mind as a way of you know qualifying convalescent mm -hmm. plasma for sure. Um, I should say though that likely you know the monoclonal antibodies that are coming to the fore will you know re replace the use of convalescent plasma going forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Kaylin. Uh, Kaylin, would you uh, unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah. Hi. Um, so my question was just related to oftentimes people with autoimmune conditions can experience different types of flare-ups. And I was curious to know if this could influence your results when processing patient samples. Um, that might be at varying levels of their condition? Um, or have you actually seen this influence results at all? No, I love the question. And it's, it's a really good one. Um, so one, that's one thing we've tried to do is to obtain samples longitudinally, especially in a disease like an autoimmune disease where, where you can get, you know, a highly temporally fluctuating course of disease where you can go into remission, you can have, air, you know, flares. Um, and in our lupus cohort, we actually did have longitudinal samples on some of those patients. Um, and what we found is that those autoantibody levels were, were actually pretty stable um, temporally over time, even though the disease severity may have been changing. And I would say that there's a lot of reasons that a, a disease can flare or not. And, and some of that may not have to do with the exact autoantibodies that are being made, but the, the character of those autoantibodies. So there's a whole literature, I'm sure you're, you're familiar with it, but antibody glycosylation. Um, can greatly impact effector function. Um, you know, this is work from Jeff Ravitch and, and from Taya, Taya Wong at Stanford. In fact, Taya, um, she just had a really interesting paper showing that, that patients with severe lupus had more of the um, lower degrees of sialylation on their antibodies. And that's associated with the more inflammatory antibody response. Um, and so, you know, that's been seen in lupus as well. Um, that, you know, in times of flares, you see less sialylation, you see more of the inflammatory glycosylation patterns. So definitely something to look at. In our current iteration of, of REAP, um, we don't distinguish between different glycoforms of the antibody, but we could actually modify the system to pick those up. Um, you know, and again, like right now, we're, we're using REAP to look at IgG, but it can be repurposed to look at IgA. We could look at specific subtypes using the appropriate secondary in the screen. So that, that would be a great research question going forward if we had a well-characterized um, patient population with good longitudinal data, a wide range of clinical severity, if we could monitor, you know, what was the glycosylation state of the antibodies against their targets over time, we could get at exactly those types of questions, um, as well as just looking at, you know, the repertoire of autoantibodies that they had. That's the other hypothesis is that they get different responses during different times of the disease. Um, so, so good question, and, and we can get at that. I don't have hard data for you to answer that question right now. Great, thank you. So Aaron, I'll, I'll go now. First, I mean, that was amazing. I have so many questions uh, and I'm gonna email you right after this. Um, <laughs> so, I, you know, I love how you've walked us through a couple different ways that, um, you know, antibodies are not, not all created equal. Um, you know, you just mentioned glycosylation status, um, you know, you reminded us that autoantibodies can be protective. Um, I, I love something you did in your paper that you didn't touch on here, which is where you were, um, you were looking at those um, cytokine autoantibodies, the CXCL7, uh, CXCL1. And you used a cell culture assay to, you know, figure, you know, when we hear antibody, we're we're like, oh, we assume that it's inhibitory, um, but not all not all antibodies are inhibitory. And so I love that you dug into the the mechanism, uh, and maybe you're going to show us some. Um, I think I think we got that here with the you talking about the chemokines here, the CXCL1. Yeah. So yeah, I, I brushed oh, through this, but yeah, yeah, exactly right. So these both bind, these both engage CXCR2. Yeah. And uh, we, we found that, uh, you know, the autoantibodies in patients who had you know, their serum neutralized this, um, it's called a presto tango assay and it involves yeah. beta arrestin recruitment. Um, and, and they were functional. And incidentally, we also found autoantibodies against CXCR2 as well. And, mm -hmm. and those were present in patients who had, um, you know, depletion of their classical monocyte populations. So mm -hmm. it was kind of interesting that certain chemokine pathways, 
um, were targeted and that chemokines in general were a very prevalent target um, in, in the COVID patients. You know, so here's some examples here. Yeah, so my question is, um, um, you know, if you wanted to set up a battery of cell culture follow-ups to, um, you know, uh, how many do you have in the cupboard that, that you could look at? So the nice thing about cytokines, uh, and, you know, is, is if, if they act on any cell in the peripheral blood, you can do, you know, pretty straightforward phosphoflow assays, right? So you don't even have to have a special assay. So for GMCSF, we did that pretty easily. We did it, you know, pretty easily for type one interferon. Um, you know, so we can turn the crank on on those types of assays where there's there's robust, you know, media like Stat5. For some of the other ones like IL1, IL18 signaling, um, harder to to monitor in a fossil flow assay, looking at like phospho and NF kappa B, et cetera. Um, so we have to rely on other systems. Um, but no, there are, you know, for, for cytokines and chemokines, you know, we have the whole Presto Tango, you know, assay that is very straightforward. We have, you know, phospho flow. So we, we, we can do a lot more functional assays. And, you know, now I'm worried that you're one of our reviewers, Lauren, because <laughs> they asked us for a bunch more uh, characterization of many of these, of these cytokines. So um, yeah, we're, we're, we're working on that. Yeah. Hey, awesome. Um, so do you have another one? I've got a bunch more. Uh, yes. So uh, Aaron, um, hey, is it okay if I go, Lauren, or do you want to go? Uh, you, you go. Okay. Um, Aaron, this is about the source of autoantibodies. Um, so autoantibodies against, so, so my question is, we see these autoantibodies in COVID and also in other diseases. So what exactly is happening here? For example, um, John Laura Casanova showed that autoantibodies against type one interferons, um, uh, they probably have a genetic predisposition. Um, and, but then we also know that some viruses uh, trigger the immune system to go rogue and you see all this manifestation. In your case, you see, in the case of COVID, you see a spectrum of antibodies, autoantibodies. So what are your thoughts on what's happening here? Is it genetic predisposition or is it the viral attack or is it a mix of everything? Do we even, can we even know an answer to these questions? Yeah, so I think, I think somebody can know and answer these questions. I'm, I'm just a yeoman. I'm just a yeoman receptorologist. Um, no, I'm, I, I, I'm just kidding. I, I should say that, um, that our, our data does not fundamentally get at that question. It's a question we're really interested in. Where do these antibodies come from? And I, I suspect that there are many reasons why there's not like one reason that explains all of these autoantibodies. So some of them, I think very clearly, um, are, are not related to the infection, but rather they had a severe outcome in the infection because they had those antibodies. That's clearly the case um, for the type one interferon autoantibodies as Casanova's group, group showed and, and as we confirmed and extended you know, with, with clinical data. Um, and if you look at the time course of these antibodies, you know, they were high even at like three days post symptom onset. I, I, you know, that, that would be an extremely fast response, very unlikely to be a, a consequence of the virus. So, so clearly some of these, some of these, you know, um, antibodies lie in this bucket. Um, and they're really important because, because knowing about them could say something about risk, could say something about the, the pathways involved. We think they're important. Some though, like you pointed out, are clearly a result of the virus, um, or a consequence of being infected. And the reason that these come up you know, is unclear. And as I said in my talk, I would say our data argue against molecular mimicry as the dominant mechanism for these antibody responses. That's not to rule out molecular mimicry. That is to say autoantibodies against a viral antigen, then recognizing, um, you know, serendipitously um, a similar structure within our own um, proteome, right? Um, you know, I, I think that's unlikely because we just saw so many different responses that typically when you, you see something molecular mimicry, you, you would see, um, you know, a handful of very common public autoantigens. Um, th th there probably is some molecular mimicry happening. There have been some papers showing that uh, anti-spike protein antibodies can, you know, demonstrate variable levels of autoreactivity. So, so there may be some um, basis to that. But of the responses we saw, I think it argues against molecular mimicry as the major driver. And rather what may be happening uh, is a, a combination of, of many different mechanisms. And one that I particularly favor is that when, when you get a severe infection, you get 
um, in inflammation, you get release of antigens, and that creates a vicious cycle where you're, you're getting um, a, a perfect milieu to activate new B cell responses or to you know, trigger um, the, the activation of latent autoreactive B cells in the body. Because again, you release the antigen plus you now have the inflammation needed to prime. Uh, and in particular, we know that, that, that there are certain cytokines that are particularly high in COVID like IL-1 and IL-18. And those are products of the inflammasome. And it's long been known that, that those cytokines can promote um, you know, T cell independent B cell responses um, like what we see with extra follicular responses. And, and those, those cytokines could um, and, and others could contribute to, um, to what we see. Potentially some of the good news there is, is those types of autoantibodies tend to be to have um, you know, a, a shortened longevity. And so I think it's more likely that they may wane post-infection. But I think uh, we're clearly gonna need to, to do more extensive follow-up on this cohort that we have to see how did these autoantibodies persist over time. Thanks. Uh, a quick follow-up, I mean, adding to that question. So what would your thoughts, or again, very speculative, on uh, treating these patients with severe immune autoimmune response with uh, immune suppressants? I mean, it might be counterintuitive, like the time when you need your immune system to come and fight this disease you're trying to suppress, but if the if the auto, if the auto antibodies are doing so much damage, would it make sense to put them on some kind of an immune suppressant? Yeah, that's definitely one of the implications of our work that that perhaps we should consider targeting the autoantibodies themselves, say with like plasma exchange, mm -hmm. um, targeting the production of the autoantibodies, say by targeting B cells with rituxan, darotumumab to target plasma cells. Um, all I think reasonable hypotheses for us to consider um, but I would say probably more in the subacute chronic setting um, where, you know, these antibodies could, could be contributing maybe to some of these, um, you know, more, more subacute chronic um, phenotypes. I think it'd be, you know, it, it, it's a bit of a tough um, balance when a patient's acutely infected in the hospital. Um, if, if you're then going to immunosuppress them, um, and we know that, you know, for instance, we even saw patients that had, had impaired humoral immunity because they had low B cell levels um, as having severe COVID. So, you know, Clearly, um, our, our work can support those hypotheses, but they need to be rigorously tested preclinically and, and in the setting of a, of a clinical trial. But it, it definitely is um, you know, a, a good thought. And if, and if we can implicate autoantibodies in long COVID, then I would say definitely these are hypotheses we should be aggressively pursuing. Hmm. Thank you. Hey, Lauren, you have questions? Yeah, okay, I can't wait. Um, so, I, I, I'm wondering, I mean, so obviously I, I, I'd like to pitch some cytoplasmic um, antigens for you as well, but that's not what I'm gonna ask. What I'm gonna ask is, um, have you thought, um, even if you just keep your, your you know, 3000 odd extracellular uh, proteins, have you thought about incorporating, um, you know, coding SNPs and we could computationally pre-screen them for ones that would likely change confirmation, et cetera, and incorporate those in. And so if you have allele dependent autoimmunity. Yeah, I love that idea. We're, so everything we show at the library is like version 0 0.5, version 1.0. Yeah. We're constantly in the process of improving the library, expanding the library, adding in more antigens. So for instance, you know, um, sometimes for whatever reason, we didn't get an antigen to clone properly. So we've gone back and tried to add them. We've tried to expand things that we missed the first time, we're trying to add in interesting antigens. Like we added all the common cold coronaviruses as well as COVID-2, MERS, SARS, receptor binding domains. Those are not initially present in our library, but we added them. And then, you know, Akiko has convinced us that we should add all sorts of other viral antigens as well. Mm -hmm. There are other technologies out there like the phage um, immune precipitation seek, FIP seek. There's a, there's a particular technology called VIRSCAN where they have, they have like thousands of different viral antigens. That is particularly good at this, like telling you what have you been infected with? What do you have antibodies to? What are the immunodominant epitopes? But, but again, there are a bunch of viral antigens that are conformational and extracellular, um, you know, nucleocapsid, or sorry, like, a, you know, envelope proteins, um, so, you know, all EBV, CMV, they have all sorts of immunomodulatory proteins. So we're getting really interested in that. But as to your suggestion for like um, potentially incorporating SNP specific autoantibodies. We hadn't thought about that, but I love that idea. You know, if there were particularly, um, if the genetics had implicated particular 
you know, SNPs, then my goodness, that would be very straightforward for us to, to put those in the library. Um, as for like cytoplasmic nuclear antigens, I have to say, um, yeast display is not a good technology for that. Those will, you know, remember we're forcing the proteins through the endoplasmic reticulum. So yeah. those proteins are going to, um, they're going to be tied up in the ER because they'll have all sorts of cysteines and, you know, that'll form inappropriate disulfides, but. A lot of them can display really well, but we'll take that offline. Um, okay. Well then, yeah, then, then if, if we can curate them, let's get them in. Sure. Yeah. Um, so easy question. So um, I know there are a lot of data sets out there for um, uh, autoantibodies in healthy uh, populations to have a baseline to compare against. Have you guys acquired a pretty large data set to, you know, see what, what assay specific um, levels look like? Yeah, so when we present the heat maps, um, we, we curate them so that we show things that are, that are um, where we saw responses only in the disease versus the, the healthy control. So we're focusing on potentially disease driving, defining responses. But um, I should say that, yeah, we see all sorts of reactivities in healthy people all the time. Um, you know, it's actually astonishing what you'll sometimes see really, really interesting stuff. And, and again, I think that's why it'd be so interesting to develop a, a very large serological atlas and really start to do sort of the next generation, um, you know, systems analyses, you know, uh, machine learning, AI, to understand what do those responses mean? How do they impact health and disease? Um, you know, and, and not just focusing on disease defining antibodies, but thinking about, you know, what are the impact of, of antibodies that are present in, in healthy people? Um, so, so we see them, but we haven't done any sort of analyses to impart or infer function. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we got another audience question. Hey, Aaron, we have an audience question, but just making sure, are you okay with time? Because it's already one o'clock. Um, yeah, I'm okay. Great. Hey, uh, Kaylin, welcome back. Ask away. Hi, so um, my question is kind of, I guess a simple one, but um, have you, decided to look at any way um, that patients with particular post-COVID symptoms um, are correlated at all with particular antibodies. Um, and I'm kind of thinking along the lines of a lot of COVID patients are now getting diagnosed with a condition called POTS, which is postural orthostatic tachycardic syndrome. Um, and pre-pandemic time, it's there was not a whole lot of literature about it, but it was kind of generally accepted as not being autoimmune even though many people who have autoimmune conditions, it's kind of actually associated with also people having POTS, this form of dysautonomia. And I'm curious now actually if your, um, if REAP would be able to maybe answer this question more if it, or if you thought about this um, at all. Great, great question. Would, would, would love to look into sort of these, um, you know, uh, idiopathic, poorly understood conditions like this um, where, you know, so far it's been claimed they're not related to, to the immune system, but I would contend, well, how, how have you really looked though, right? I mean, you know, we haven't really had good technologies to, to assess that. And I think technologies like FIPSEQ, technologies like REAP, protein arrays will allow us to take a more unbiased view about conditions exactly like that. Um, and, and that's the way why we, why we want to run long COVID in, and in a related fashion, we also want to look at, you know, chronic fatigue syndrome, um, you know, MECSF, you know, other post viral syndromes that are not well understood that for many years have been derided as, you know, not particularly, um, you know, rooted in, in the scientific evidence, but these patients have really, um, you know, huge impact in their, in their life and they deserve uh, a new look at their disease with new technology. So yeah, we'd be very keen to run. Um, you know, patients with POTS and ME-CFS and other, you know, post-viral syndromes and see if we can't, you know, get new insights and maybe um, more defining, you know, molecular defining features of those diseases. Um, so th that, that's the first part of your question. You know, in terms of looking at, at long COVID, post-COVID syndromes, that, that's an area of, of intense interest to us right now. Um, part, part of the issue is, is getting um, samples where we have really good longitudinal data on those patients, right? Where we, you know, we have initial samples from when that patient was in the hospital during their course and then many months later, um, as opposed to you know, just trying to get any samples we can get from a long COVID um, clinic. We, we think it'll be much more informative. We can follow up in the same patients we already saw before or, or if a collaborator had long-term you know, acute you know, immediately during COVID and post COVID samples as well. Um, so at Yale, 
we, um, my, my colleague Wade Schultz has started a new um, pipeline where we can actually pull patient serum samples, plasma samples from the auto analyzers. So if they come into the hospital or our clinics for any reason um, and we flag them, we can grab what's left over from the routine assays. And so we, we can, we now have started doing that. We've pulled hundreds of, of patient samples that we saw in the first wave of the pandemic and we're running them now with REAP. And so we can see what was the longitudinality to those responses and then look to see, does, does that correspond with, with long-term um, you know, features? Did they have, you know, are these the patients who have impaired pulmonary function? Are these the patients that have had chronic fatigue? Uh, you know, we're, we're looking to send questionnaires out to these patients to see, you know, which of the long COVID syndrome syndromes they may have or not. One criticism of that approach, though, is that it seems that many of the patients, if not most of the patients with post-COVID syndrome, were not those that were that had the most severe disease. So they may not, they may never have come into the hospital in the first place. Um, and so you know, that's why it'll be important to supplement our, our cohort with some of those less severely affected patients that are not in the impact cohort. Because again, the impact cohort was all almost all patients who were in Yale New Haven Hospital. So they were sick enough to be admitted. Um, so that, that is one limitation uh, of what we're doing now. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Aaron. Um, I, I have a question. Oh, wait, am I muted? No, okay. Um, this is rather possibly a simple question and I'm sorry if I missed it during your talk. Uh, this is regarding tissue specific antibodies. Now COVID, clearly has different manifestation, affects different organs differently. And you also see a range of tissue specific antibodies. So my question is, was there any correlation between tissue specific antibodies and patient outcome? There was, I, um, I, I pulled that data out of my slides to the presentation today just due to space. But in our preprint, we, we did do that analysis for, for many different autoantigens. By and large, most of the autoantibody responses did not correlate to particular severity. And that could just be a manifestation of the fact that these patients are so inflamed, they're making antibodies to everything. And most of the time, like a random mutation, those antibodies may not have a big impact on the disease. But we did find some that did correlate to severity, that did correlate to specific features of the disease, um, laboratory findings. And I showed the one example on this slide, I'll just quickly put it back up. Of, uh, of, of patients who made autoantibodies against the hypocretin-2 receptor, um, which is the one of the receptors for orexin. And you can see that the patients who had the highest levels of these autoantibodies had the lowest neurological um, score. You know, they had the lowest Glasgow Coma Scale score. In fact, um, this score right here, three, is the lowest possible score you can have. So this is a crude measure. Um, and certainly be better to get, you know, if we could get MRI data, if we could get EEG data, these patients unfortunately doesn't exist. Um, and most of these patients actually died. However, I think one of the patients at the most high levels, most severe neurological condition, they did survive. And these autoantibodies have been implicated in narcolepsy, actually. So it'd be really interesting to look at, at these ones and others um, that, that we have found correlations to. Ultimately, though, I think in order to really derive, um, you know, strong um, you know, inferences about relationships of autoantibodies and particular disease features of, of, of COVID, we need to run many more patient samples and with different cohorts, not just, you know, from Yale, but, you know, from other hospitals, other areas of the country, um, so that we're not, you know, biased with our particular patient demographics here. Awesome. Okay, Aaron, I got one more before we let you go. <laughs> um, so one of the things we see in lupus is that the patients that have the most severe trajectory are the ones that develop autoantibodies that give rise to a positive feedback loop. So for instance, you know, Rola, I mean, if you wanted to mess with a cell, you know, and you could only develop one autoantibody, DNA is a pretty good target. Um, and for protein targets, you know, Rho, La, Nucleolin, which is involved in BDJ recombination, et cetera, also really good targets. So do you, I mean, you showed us a lot of immune targets, you know, ligands, receptors, et cetera. Um, have you guys pieced together anything that looks like a positive feedback loop where, you know, if you knock that out, then you get routed down a, a path of even more severe disease? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, you know, things that can give rise to a vicious cycle um, so, so, 
like I said, you know, by and large in, in lupus, very heterogeneous disease. And correspondingly, you can see that very heterogeneous autoantibody responses. So one thing that made our um, analysis a little challenging is that oftentimes we only saw particular responses like, you know, out of a hundred patients, maybe we saw it like four times, right? Like these patients with autoantibodies against CCL8, for instance, okay, they were enriched in the severe patients. We saw it four times. So I, I would say tough to really stick our neck out there and say, are these, um, you know, are, are definitely uh, pathogenic. But, you know, I think even these antibodies could contribute to a feedback loop, right? So CCL8 is a really important chemokine for, for positioning Treg. You can imagine if you inhibited this chemokine that the Treg may not be able to get into the most inflamed sites, and that could then lead to more inflammation, more antigen release, you know, a feedback loop like that. Um, I think, you know, looking at, at autoantibodies we see on this end of the spectrum here in the severe end of the spectrum will allow us to get insights into, you know, some of those really pathogenic um, autoantibodies that, that contribute to feed forward um, inflammation. Um, whereas if we look on this end of the spectrum, we'll find things that perhaps, you know, put the brakes on those responses. I think we just need to run a lot more patients. So we ran a hundred here. The fact that we see really interesting responses in like one patient out of a hundred make me think that um, the most interesting antibodies may be prevalent at like 1% or less. And so really we don't need to run a hundred patients. We need to run a thousand or 10,000. And, and fortunately we have the throughput to do that. We just don't have the samples. So if yeah. you know anybody who's got really good samples, uh, well, well, <laughs> let me, let yeah. me know. Yeah. And so I'm going to email you, but I mean, so for lupus, I mean, a lot of the most interesting autoantibodies are of course cytoplasmic and not in your screen. Uh, I meant for COVID. Um, do, do you? Oh, for COVID. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, the interferons are obviously, you know, going to be a ho horrible feed forward one. Um, you know, anything that impairs early virological control. So it's really interesting. We found these antibodies against the IL-18 pathway and IL-1. And those are two of the most pathogenic cytokines in severe COVID. Uh, Akiko her, she had a great paper where they showed that IL-18 was actually the most predictive cytokine of any um, in severe COVID. And, and IL-18 can drive extra follicular B cell responses, T cell independent. Um, interestingly, we found that patients that had autoantibodies against IL-18 or IL-1 had severe COVID. Mm -hmm. And that could be because, you know, you're impairing the early vi virological control, right. like with the interferon. So I would say those are the, be the ones that, that I'm thinking could have these sort of feed forward loops. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we, we, we should, we should think more about that. I mean, part of the problem too, I should just add in, in closing is that our cohort is heavily focused on patients who had severe disease, even though we call some mild, they're not really mild. These are right. patients that were sick enough to be in the hospital during the first wave of the pandemic when the hospitals were overflowing. Mm -hmm. It's very tough to get patients with samples from asymptomatic patients because they don't know they have it. And if they do have it, they're not giving, I mean, we have no mechanism to easily get their blood. So that's one limit. If we could get more of these asymptomatic patients, maybe we would be able to suss out some of those um, pathological antibodies. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Aaron, that was amazing. We kept you long. I've got a lot more questions. <laughs> um, it was my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and so Matt, can you um, show the slide for yeah. next week? <laughs> Yeah, everyone join us, um, same time, same place for Shane Crotty, um, more immunology. And thanks again, Aaron, and stay safe, everyone. Thank you.